On this channel, I talk a lot about capitalism because it's such a powerful force in the world. It shapes our whole lives, from the laws that we have to follow, to what we do with our lives, to how we feel about ourselves. But sometimes I think we don't talk enough about another force that shapes everything, nationalism. I've actually explained what it is and why patriotism is just a euphemism for nationalism, so I'm going to avoid repeating anything I've said before. But as usual, there's a lot to be said, so this will be another series. I don't think we can understand nationalism until we understand what the nation-state is. I figured if the theocratic fascist can make a documentary asking a question he doesn't want to hear the answer to, I've got a better question. One that actually matters. What really is a country? I've listed some books in the description that you can read that answer that question at length if you're really interested. But they're the kind of book that could just be an it had to be said video if you just took out the unnecessary 97%. So read them if you like, there's some interesting history in them, but I'm here to get to the point. One book you'll find in the description is this one. Benedict Anderson said the nation is best described as an imagined community. What he meant was, unlike a real community, you can't know everyone in your imagined community. You don't live in the same place, most of them you'll never even see or hear about, yet from birth we're told this is our community. We're told that this community is united by a shared history, common territory that they own together, and a state that represents them. We need to talk about the state. You know, like government, rulers, the institutions that make and enforce laws over us. That state. States established their rule by conquering people and their land. Over time, they formalize their power to make it seem eternal and unchallengeable. They homogenize culture and language by force. They write the history we learn to forget. In what way does the state represent us? It never does what we want. <laughs> it works for people with money and property and lobby groups. In what way could it represent us? We're diverse people who don't benefit from one-size-fits-all policy, so by default the state works for the richest people with the most powerful connections. I don't want to spend hours demolishing all the claims the state makes to justify its existence, so check out this playlist breaking down how democracy and the state really work. I think when people say, you know, when they believe that the state represents anyone but the most powerful, they mean that, like, one of the people who controlled the state maybe 200 years ago made a speech where he said the state was for the people. As Howard Zinn said in A People's History of the United States, We must not accept the memory of states as our own. Nations are not communities, and never have been. The history of any country, presented as the history of a family, conceals fierce conflicts of interest, sometimes exploding, most often repressed, between conquerors and conquered, masters and slaves, capitalists and workers, dominators and dominated in race and sex. The state, that's all states, without exception, creates and maintains a hierarchy, embodied in a small ruling class of people who own everything and treat people as their tools. The people in the territory they control are subject to the state's laws and ideologies. This is a simplistic understanding of social hierarchy, of course, but it's enough for our purposes today. The nation is the state's attempt to flatten that hierarchy in our minds. That's why we're always told the powerful only represent us, not rule us, like, like in the past. They work for us now. Or, or everyone is free and equal in front of the law, so we think of the nation as, in Anderson's words, a deep horizontal comradeship, 
Ultimately, it's this fraternity that makes it possible over the past two centuries for so many millions of people not so much to kill as willingly to die for such limited imaginings. Rulers did not always feel the need to preside over states with just one language or culture. Diversity is the historical norm. Political boundaries are invariably set by states and empires fighting wars for the territory that today constitutes my country. That's why it's shaped like that, and therefore why I'm loyal to that shape on the map. But culture doesn't begin or end at political boundaries. Same with language and history. You can have multiple coexisting cultures, or existing close to one another and regularly interacting on equal terms. Many places are made up of two or several cultural and linguistic groups living in harmony, but propaganda, war, and borders can tear them apart. The project of creating a single, homogeneous culture within a given territory takes a lot of force. By the end of the 19th century, Europeans and others felt that they were part of a country with a shared history, language, and culture. And they valued that homogeneity to the point they would use any kind of violence in its name, which culminated in World War II. The state likes homogeneity because it makes it easy to enforce intellectual conformity. But creating and enforcing homogeneity takes compulsion on a mass scale and often involves expelling or killing off whole groups of people. Benedict Anderson says the imagined community was created in large part by the new print media industry opened up by Gutenberg's printing press. Instead of writing for every vernacular in Europe, print media companies would make material in, in one widely spoken dialect, which would go on to become the official language of what became that country. Eventually, all media would be in that language, and other languages would be forgotten. The state, which had more or less just finished conquering as much territory as it could in Europe by that time, found this turn of events useful to homogenize the populations they had conquered through language. States prefer a simple, straightforward world they can impose their will on. The more similar everyone is, the easier they are to govern. Why do you think states teach people to read? Do you think it's for our benefit? If you can read, you can read state-approved history books and learn to believe what they tell you. States rob whole generations of history, culture, and language. If you can read, you can sign contracts and fill out tax forms, so mass literacy is essential to the system the state imposes on us, which means you pretty much have to learn to read or you'll suffer. Teaching formerly independent and nomadic people to read is not an act of liberation. It's forced assimilation. States didn't just homogenize language and culture, but even invented history and traditions. Myth is integral to the nation, which means truth is unimportant or even dangerous, a threat to the myth that holds us together. For centuries now, states have been fostering nationalism, a loyalty to the nation state, by creating an artificial national culture. They have various tools at their disposal, from history textbooks to TV media to cross-country highways and railways. In using them, states obscure both the similarities and the differences among countries. We're taught to think of everyone else as different, you know, the bad different. Some of them are enemies, which puts them on our level, and some as beneath contempt, inherently inferior. The nation-state requires a continuous flow of us-versus-them stereotypes. The ruling state creates a whole language of the nation. Constitutions and the people invoking them to impose their policies don't say they're concentrating power for their own purposes. They talk about we the people, we as a nation, our values, the national interest, national security, rights, freedoms, honor, duty, and sacrifice to construct the nation in our minds. But you can always question the words. For example, there's no 
national interest because everyone's interests are different. The interests of the people at the top of the social hierarchy, the ones who decide what the national interest is, have really different interests from the people they rule. They want more effective propaganda, laws that maximize their profits, and people fighting over things other than who has all the money. Here are some more words you can question, talking about my country and being from a country. Are you really from a country? How much of it are you from? Because most people are from a town or city. Most people have never been to most of what they call their country, and in fact, many of them are trying to emigrate. Many of the people who claim to love my country seem to hate certain aspects of it, including at least one large group of people in it. They don't like their political opponents, so they hate like half the people, and might not even count them as part of their country. They don't like anyone in the country without the state's permission. They don't like separatists, obviously, so that's another group, and probably socialists for the same reasons. Obviously, we have to keep the country intact so the political class owns and exploits all the territory it claims. That's the only way you can have a culture, apparently. None of it translates to any kind of power or material benefit to you, of course, but to a nationalist, it's the lines that matter. As long as the lines still make up the same shape on the map, nationalists don't care what the system does to poor people. Words, symbols, and shapes make up the nation. Because we've learned to love the country, we love the symbols associated with it. People build their identities around symbols and compete to see who can show the most love for them. Look how many likes and shares people can get just for posting a picture of a flag or talking about a possible violation of the legal code for flags. I cannot think of a bigger waste of time. It doesn't affect your life. This is how a state maintains its existence, by instilling love for symbols and saying it is the eternal protector of the symbols. It's how politicians get votes, certainly the right-wing ones, but even the liberal ones are usually easily goaded into waving a flag, so liberals can say they love symbols too. Eric Hobsbawm talked about how a nation is constituted in the past. Justifications for the, for the country's existence, all beliefs about culture and tradition, why we hate those guys next door... Historians create the memories people have and keep alive and use to justify everything, even if they never happened. As a historian himself, Hobsbawm would liken his job to that of a poppy grower or drug dealer for nationalists. History is a big part of speaking the nation-state into being. Nationalism assumes you have a nation, which is called my country that you have to believe in and assume is different and like a little more than the others and stick up for as if it was your mother, even if it abuses you, and call home even though you've never been to most of it, and call your family even though you'll never even meet 1% of its population. I've been instructed to identify with my country, and that collective vanity is just fine, so I want to assume all the good things I've been told about my country are true, and obviously that the bad things are false, or exceptions to the rule that we're good, really. If our nation is just one among many, we're not special. But if we're unique, superior, with a glorious past and future, history will remember us. Nationalism also assumes the state is, can be, or should be the representative of the people. As a result, we approve of the state's power over us and excuse its violence, defending the state's actions as if they were our own. We'll even take up arms to defend our rulers, the ones we've been complaining about all this time, if they tell us the country is under threat.
we care more about keeping the nation state intact than we do about any of the people whose lives it's ruined, more than our own freedom. And the only reason anyone can give me is if the state didn't use so much violence, things would be even worse. Civilians who identify with the state approve of and commit violence in its name, whether or not they're officially in its employ. To real Americans, you know, white settlers who love words and symbols, nation, state, race, and religion are all kind of the same thing, in the way that you can't separate the strawberries from the rest of the smoothie. Since the state has historically committed all kinds of violence to terrorize black and indigenous people, civilians have carried on the tradition in lynching. Every time someone's murdered by a white vigilante who felt threatened by their existence, you see white people all over social media saying that dead person was a criminal, and white people should take the law into their own hands. To them, the nation and the state are the same, so they, as the nation, are deputies of the state. The state regularly kills or otherwise ruins the lives of the people it's racialized, so loyal citizens think they can and should do the same. They often get off scot-free, maybe because they get to claim self-defense. That guy was black and in my neighborhood. The kid was crossing the border without the permission of my country. Mass shooters and other Avengers think of themselves as the good guy with the gun. The guy whose violence is warranted to combat a threat to my country or my race or whatever they've learned you're supposed to kill people for. To all intents and purposes, the country is the state. The state created the shape and the lines and lumped together the people of the country through conquest. The state creates the country for you every day in its words and actions. It tells you you're a unified society and culture under the state, so you channel your energy into the work it demands of you. That's why you don't matter to the state. To the state, you're just a tool, as expendable as any other. Because as a person, as opposed to an institution, you're not an integral part of the country. Or, as O'Brien put it in 1984, you do not exist. You're more like a cell of a larger body, and if you die, you'll be regrown. That's why it makes no sense to say, I love my country, but I hate my government. It's like saying, I, I love myself, but I hate my brain. You might mean you love the culture, some of the people and places, but there's no way to love the whole country without using a lot of imagination. JFK said not to ask what your country can do for you, because unless you're rich, that's nothing, but to do things for your country. He was pointing out to those paying attention there are no tangible benefits to citizenship, only obligations. At that time, the U.S. was escalating the conflict in Indochina, invading Cuba to turn back the revolution, killing and locking up black revolutionaries at home, and spending billions of dollars to be the first country to get to the moon while people on the ground went hungry. He wanted you to sign up for that, instead of selfishly expecting the state to use the money and power it took from you for something that might benefit you. So are you sure you have a country? Are you sure it exists? Are you sure it's yours? Maybe you don't need one. Maybe you're a whole person without needing to believe in and die for an imagined community. Next week, we're taking a look at one of the effects of believing in the imagined community, arguing about politics. See you then.